Hey, welcome to BJJ Mental Models, episode 131. I'm Steve Kwan. BJJ Mental Models is your guide to a conceptual and intelligent jujitsu approach. And today, highly requested guest, glad to finally have here on the podcast, Ms. Margot Ciccarelli. Margot, how are you doing? I'm great, Steve. Thank you again for inviting me onto the podcast. Like I've been a big fan for a long time and I'm excited for this conversation. Fantastic. So you are a fascinating character because you live the nomadic life. I mean, you were doing that before the Oscars made it cool this year. Where are you right now? <laughs> so I'm in New York City right now and my partner and I have kind of been bouncing back and forth between Mexico City and she hasn't been back to New York recently just because there's been like a lot of the Asian hate that's been happening recently. But mm -hmm. Mexico City has been a really consistent base for us this year. Most of the pandemic last year, we were really bouncing around a lot. We went from a little island next to Madagascar to Ireland, Dublin. We were everywhere. But again, we were also trying to navigate the pandemic in a very responsible way. Yeah, I... Interestingly, you know, it's kind of funny. I think that this podcast might be the most Asian jujitsu podcast there is. Cause of course I'm Asian. My brother, Matt is Asian <laughs> and we've had a lot of Asian guests on recently. And I mean, I, the funny thing is, I know that a lot of people don't listen to this podcast in a timely fashion. We intend for the content to be relatively evergreen. So sometimes we get people listening way behind the curve, but yeah, the Asian hate thing is something that. I mean, I could talk for days about this, and I know that's not really the theme of the episode, but it's worth mentioning. You know, I had, I've lived a pretty blessed life in a lot of ways. I've never really felt the brunt of direct racism up until about the last year or so. And I've had about six experiences in the past year since the pandemic started, three physical in-person confrontations and three online. And I mean, I'm not even like, you know, full Asian, I'm three eighths Chinese. And I've just found it to be completely demoralizing. I mean, th this is, again, this is a, I'd love to talk for days and days and days about this. It's something that I'm super passionate about, but it is a real thing. And it has really forced me to think that maybe, you know, it, it's, it's not enough to just stand against racism and just say the right thing but actually there needs to be more aggressive action taken against this kind of stuff in our community because yeah i mean as an asian grappler here in bc i i can tell you firsthand that i've experienced it and it it sounds like probably it's something that you are sadly familiar with too actually i've been quite fortunate for, for myself that i haven't directly experienced it but i have had people within my network who have been impacted by it and even if they haven't been impacted by it, I don't think anyone should have to live in fear that they can't go outside, especially, I really couldn't understand that there were so many attacks, especially on the elderly, you know, like that really did not make any sense to me at all. And I, I think it's really sad that our elders, like even in New York Chinatown, they're just getting attacked. They worry to leave the house. I don't think anyone should have to feel like that. I think, you know, especially as a fighting community, the jiu-jitsu community, I, I've been really trying to find ways to create some sort of incentive that maybe jiu-jitsu schools can offer to work with elders or set up some sort of some sort of incentive that we can group together to not not just teach self-defense, but just make people feel confident again, just to live their normal lives because our, our lives have been turned upside down for the last year already, you know, by pandemic, we don't really need to be trying to isolate each other even more. But yeah, as you said, I'm sure we could talk for days on this topic. Yeah, it's it's been an interesting year for sure. I mean, here in Vancouver, we also have a, a very large Asian population. And I saw in the news that since the pandemic started, anti-Asian violence has gone up by over 800% here in the Vancouver area. Over 800%. That's insane. And sadly, like you said... That's crazy. Yeah. And like you said, sadly, a lot of the time it's perpetrated against older people too, presumably because they're considered to be easier targets. So anyway... Like you said, I could go on about this for days. I don't want this to be too much of a downer, maybe a topic for another day, but something that you had flagged as a great topic for this episode, something I love because we've never actually talked about before, is the concept of communication in jujitsu. Now, communication can have a lot of meanings. You can be talking about just the words that we speak. You can be talking about nonverbal cues that we issue when we talk to each other, but 
within the context of a physical art like jujitsu, there's also almost like a dance-like quality to it where you learn as you get more experienced to read the mechanics of your body. You learn to also send signals with your body that you can use to to turn the fight in your favor. And this is something that, I mean, honestly, you know, white belts and blue belts usually don't think about. But as you get to black belt, it does become something that you need to start considering, right? You can use your body language to deceive your opponent into thinking that you're going one way versus another. You can use your body language to give your opponent an indication that their techniques are not working against you, even if they might actually be working really, really well. There's a lot of things that you can do with body language in the context of a sparring match. And I would love to explore this in a little bit more detail with you. So why don't you go ahead and kick it off? Maybe take the floor here and tell me what does communication mean to you when we're talking about BJJ? Well, firstly, you took the words right out of my mouth. The, the, the term body language in itself, it's like we are speaking with our body, right? And there's so much nuance in jiu-jitsu that I think just to talk about techniques in general, we actually strip away a lot of the other things, the other elements that we really do integrate into jiu-jitsu. And perhaps, you know, some of us call this the invisible jiu-jitsu. And I think... If we explore the idea of this being a physical dialogue, I always like to think before we even consider resistance or resistance, we can also frame it as an argument, right? Because technically a fight is an argument. Before the argument, there was usually some sort of peace, right? It was a normal conversation. So, so to say this is sort of a collaborative communication like oh, we, we are moving in collaboration, which is more like a dance-like quality that you were describing too. Now, I often think that jiu-jitsu is very much like dance, except there is a certain point in the conversation that you no longer want to collaborate, and then it does become an argument. And so mm-hmm. uh, something that we did talk about earlier, which I, I, I want to bring up, is I've been in so many different environments, so many different countries and trained jiu-jitsu, competed jiu-jitsu. I, I really do think that a person's jiu-jitsu is very representative of their personality. And I think by rolling with someone, even for the first time, you learn so much about them, like how they want to engage with you, where are they tentative, where do they feel secure? So it's kind of like learning about someone's insecurities, like what, where do they feel confident? Where do they feel strong? It, I think it's a very vulnerable experience when you roll with someone for the first time. It's like meeting someone for the first time, except that this is such a high level of intimacy for the first time. Not to go on to too many tangents, but like now going back into the concept of communication, I, I think because we aren't using words in the arts and because we are using our bodies to communicate, we're trying to communicate firstly our intention. Like where do we want to go in the space? How are we trying to manipulate our partner also in the space? Does our partner choose to collaborate with us? Usually not, right? (laughs) It's usually an argument in jujitsu. I think these are really interesting things that we can pick up in certain roles, certain flows. Also, when I talk about myself, when I roll personally, often I choose to be collaborative first. I'm not usually the type that is going to impose because usually I'm very curious about what what is that person's jiu-jitsu like? Like, how do they move? What is their movement quality like? I'm not interested in dominating the person. I understand that in jiu-jitsu we have two sets of objectives usually. We have movement objectives and finishing objectives. And now trying to dominate someone, I would say, is a very strong finishing objective. I, I think there's a really nice quality to jiu-jitsu when you just collaborate with someone. And that isn't to say that you don't advance in position. It's like this idea of give and take more so. You know, like sometimes like when you're in a relationship with someone, you do favors for them, they do favors back, kind of like that. You volunteer space, they take the space away. You give space so on and so forth. So I, I think in that way, it's really interesting like how you can really build 
a conversation with someone as opposed to i, I feel a very mainstream mentality in jiu-jitsu is dominate as quick as possible <laughs> you know especially for competitors more so i would say you know like i think it's very interesting when i talk to people especially with a competitor's identity that they usually one of the first things that they bring up to me is wow okay you really can move like that or flow like that at the highest level and it's just not basically what they expect because usually when you think of a competitor you usually think oh they're very hard they're very strong they're very fast they're very relentless i don't think those are the words that i would describe myself with actually <laughs> Yeah, that's something that I have definitely come to experience, and I have observed the same thing. If you look at original generation grapplers, there was a very tough attitude. You know, the idea being that a lot of it was about just sheer toughness, not even just about your technique. And there's there's something to be said about that, right? I mean, you can get pretty far on toughness, and if you get a person who's tough and also really good at jiu-jitsu, you're going to have a rough day if you have to fight them. So I don't belittle that or take away from that, but to your point, that that is very much an aspect of 100%. people's yeah that is very much an aspect of people's personalities right you don't have to be that person to succeed and i actually look at a lot of um, a lot of modern leg lockers and i would say that from observing their game they really don't come across as doing uh, what i would guess i guess what called bully jiu jitsu where they're basically just trying to overwhelm and crush their opponent it doesn't look that way at all it is it is kind of like a very very technical manipulative art and i I notice this with a lot of really good grapplers I roll with. I never feel like they're trying to just absolutely murder me, right? I, it's just, it's kind of like trying to swim in water, except everything you do, you just get pulled in deeper and deeper and deeper, right? When you're fighting someone who's very technical that way. And you can learn a lot about someone's style based on the cues that they give you. I mean, myself as an example, I, I don't compete and I don't really do jujitsu because I, I want to hurt anybody. Part of the reason I got into jujitsu was because I remember early in my journey, I heard Henner Gracie talking about how jujitsu is the only true self-defense martial art because every other martial art is really more self-offense, right? I mean, you're trying to knock someone out. You're trying to hurt someone. You're trying to break something. Jiu-jitsu is about de-escalation. It's about slowing down, tying up, controlling your opponents, and not stopping them, but forcing them to stop of their own volition. So it, it is a true self-defense art. And that philosophy really resonated with me. It's why I love jiu-jitsu and I do this instead of other martial arts like Muay Thai or kickboxing. And that philosophy does bleed through to my game. I mean, anyone who rolls with me knows I play a very defensive game. I set up very, very strong defensive shells and I, I just kind of bide my time and I look for an opening. I don't try to run my opponent over or go on the offense. And that's not to say that everyone's like that. I mean, I, I've sparred with a guy. One of my old training partners was a bouncer and it was very, very challenging to roll with him the first few times I did it because his, his style was downright intimidating. And I remember actually, you know, the first time I rolled with them, it kind of psychologically broke me because I didn't expect someone to be kind of trying to intimidate while rolling. But I realize now in retrospect, I mean, if this guy's day job is that he's a bouncer, like that's that's part of the style that he adopts because intimidation can be a great way to stop a fight before it even happens. So yeah, you can learn so much about a person just by by rolling with them and observing what they do on the mats. You know, it's, it's very interesting, like something that I also really like to describe movement in jiu-jitsu by is actually labeling, speaking, and listening. So how do we define that? Uh, usually when I say someone is speaking, they're usually the imposal. They're usually the one who is in action, rather. Or we could say, like, Dan Hall always likes to use this term, like offensive cycle and defensive cycle, right? Like, so whoever is the speaker is the one who's kind of going first in the conversation. If we are in the middle of an argument, for example, I'm choosing to let you speak first and the listener in the defensive cycle. So for us who tend to be more defensive or counter players, I consider myself to be a counter player. I think it's really interesting, this idea of allowing someone to speak first before you have to share what you have to say. Just like in an argument, like I'm usually not the first one to talk. I usually want to listen and to 
hear all parties speak first. And once I have all the information, then I want to talk and say my piece. And this is exactly the same way that I fight. So it's really interesting, the, the story that you share about rolling with your bouncer friends. So I, I truly think it's so interesting. Like, of course, our daily life would have such an immense influence, basically how, how we conduct ourselves in the rest of our lives, whether it's jujitsu or anything. Yeah, the thing about jujitsu that's so interesting is that even if you're sparring with really high intensity, I, I mean, I'm never really that afraid, right? Because I know no one wants to really hurt me, right? The odds of me actually getting really hurt, especially once you have a good understanding of your body mechanics, you can generally prevent a lot of injuries on the mats just by being smart about the way that you train. So I'm never really fearful for what's going to happen to me. Whereas in other martial arts, of course, you could never go 100% because you're, you know, you might be striking, you might be slamming people onto the floor. There are physical consequences to training with that kind of intensity. So in jujitsu, because it's relatively safe, I think it opens up the door to all kinds of self-expression, right? You can really be the person Absolutely. that you want to be, and you're kind of forced to be that person. And jujitsu can also change you, right? I think part of the reason why people say things like jujitsu give you confidence is because you might have people who are afraid to express themselves, but once they start rolling and they get used to people attacking them and they get used to fighting back, they start to learn to become more assertive. And it's a very physical way to train what, honestly, we all tell our kids, right? Which is, you know, you need to be assertive. Easy to say that to someone, but when you're actually on the mats rolling with someone, you have no choice but to be assertive, right? So eventually, I think that quality kind of emerges in anyone who sticks with the art for a significant period of time. 100%. Like, I, I think even the experience of entering a jiu-jitsu gym from a white belt is such a vulnerable experience. And for someone to stick through that, really learning how how to keep listening, because I, I feel the first the first couple of months at least is a very it's a listening exercise, listening and comprehension, yes. if we think about it, right? And then learning how to speak after we kind of understand the vocabulary that's being said in the room. Like I, I'm really fond of using the term movement vocabulary. So I think we choose how to speak. We choose the techniques as our vocabulary, how to chain and sequence the vocabulary together to basically make our sentences. And I think when we're a beginner, we don't have the confidence yet because while well, we lack knowledge, but slowly we build that confidence just through being consistent, showing up. And yeah, I think it's, it's really inspiring to see so many people who knew nothing about the art, stick with it, learn how to speak. Actually, one thing I wanted to bring up before I forget, I think it's really vital that in more gyms and more teachers are actually trying to say these things out loud, that self-expression in the art is really important. Maybe not in such a hippie way as I'm saying, but um. I feel like I've met a lot of people who have never contemplated this at all. And they're very stuck with just trying to use the same vocabulary as their teacher. And they wonder why things don't work or they're trying to speak with someone else's words. It's almost, I'd say, it's like trying to be someone else that isn't them, you know? So there's, there's so much in this movement platform of jujitsu and we don't necessarily need to fit the status quo like oh, our teacher says this this is the best way i think that's really important that we're able to build individuality well i think one of the lovely things about jujitsu is that as you talked about at the beginning there are these different roles that we play in conversation right we we can label we can speak and we can listen and in real life we know that listening is important right listening is kind of the cornerstone to communication and Ideally, you're supposed to be listening more than you're speaking, but the reality is people who maybe don't have the highest emotional intelligence, a lot of the time they wind up just speaking nonstop and not listening. And in the real world, you often don't get direct feedback about that, right? If I go into a room with you or I have to work with you and you just don't listen to anything I say, you just, you're constantly talking. It doesn't feel like it's a real conversation. It's just a, a one way message and you don't care what I have to say. I mean, I may never give you that feedback. I may never sit down with you and say, Margot, 
you're being an asshole, right? Like I, there's a good chance that's never going to come up in the real world. The more likely situation is I'll just ignore you or work around you or just bypass you altogether and forget you're there. But in jujitsu, you are forced to take the role of the listener, right? Because if you show up on as a day one white belt, a hundred percent. Yeah. It doesn't matter how good you think you are actions definitely speak louder than words on the mats, right? Or in this case, I guess the words are the actions. And so when the day one white belt comes in, they can think they're just the best person ever. They can they can try to do whatever they want, but a moderately competent grappler is going to show them the truth of that very quickly and force them to listen with their body, right? No one can just wander into a jujitsu gym and just wreck shop and not get feedback from anyone. Jiu-jitsu forces you to learn to to get feedback and learn to listen. And so everyone goes through that that listening phase. And then over time, as you said, I think people, as they start to get experience and build confidence, they realize, yes, this is self-expression. You know, once you build up a, a base of competence, now you can start to experiment and you can start to try new things. And one day, maybe those people who were tapping you before, now suddenly you're going toe-to-toe with them, or maybe you're even getting the better of them. And then you start to realize self-expression, you know, strategy, game planning, the way that you carve out your own unique niche in jujitsu. And I think there's an interesting journey there where people kind of come in and they start being forced to be the listener. But over time, they can take more of a speaking role, as you said, just by virtue of the fact that they get comfortable, they get confident, and they have a strong enough fundamental base now that they can start to innovate on top of that. Oh, absolutely. I, I think it's also quite funny at the beginning as a white belt, you want to speak so badly. <laughs> you like really try to speak up, but it, it's just not working. You're just getting shut down every time in the conversation. But uh, I, I think something else that was interesting that you were saying in our normal daily lives about receiving feedback and such, well, you may never receive feedback as such. I, I think If we look at the overall gym ecosystem, right, it's not even limited just to roles, right? Like if someone doesn't want to get tapped out or they know a specific person is always going to tap them out and they start avoiding them, you know, then you kind of start to learn about people more in that way or how they communicate. Like are they the type to avoid uncomfortable situations? Because the reality is if you're avoiding someone because they're better than you. You don't want to get out of your comfort zone. I think this is another part of the communication layer that I think is really important to talk about. It's not necessarily just limited to the roles in itself. It's like, what are the behaviors of the people in the ecosystem? Because often I can even give an example of pro training for, for myself. There's sometimes that I definitely think, oh my God, training is so hard against like XYZ person. And there's definitely like this, this thoughts in my head. I'm like, I really don't want to go against that person. Yeah. But I know in order to grow, in order to stay out of my comfort zone, because I know that is basically what's going to take me to a deeper understanding in my jujitsu that I have to, I have to confront it. I can't leave it alone. So I'm very much so like the type of person that believes in the growth mindset. And I think that's so really interesting trying to observe my own actions, my own thoughts, and also seeing that in others. And I think when I see things in this way, it really does become an introspective tool like of understanding more about myself, understanding more about human behavior, because it's just normal for humans to not want to be uncomfortable, you know? Yeah. So I think that's really interesting. That is such an important part of jujitsu is getting comfortable with being uncomfortable. I mean, if there's one thing that I hope people get out of training jujitsu, it is learning that growth comes beyond the point of resistance, right? If you want to actually grow and improve, you need to put yourself in the situations that you're afraid of. And in jujitsu, I mean, I, everyone does this, right? I mean, even the best in the world have had days where they just didn't want to roll with the, you know, go for the tough roll. Sometimes everyone wants an easy roll. So it's a very common human experience, but I've definitely been guilty of that where, you know, I, I dodged a tough roll just because I didn't want to get smoked in front of everybody. I mean, I think you bring up actually a really good point about how communication does not begin and end with the role. And I think that's the mistake that a lot of instructors make, right? Is they show a technique or they roll with someone and that's the end of the lesson. But there's a lot of 
lessons that are maybe more important that you can teach outside of that context if you observe someone's body language and body behavior. I mean, my instructor, for example, he's a, like a very, very heavy pressure guy. And part of what he he knows me pretty well and what he'll do, he knows that I'm not really going to learn a lesson until I start to get frustrated and pissed off. So what he'll do <laughs> is rather than telling me something when he rolls with me, if he knows I have a weakness, he'll just exploit that weakness like 800 times until I eventually say, okay, can you just stop and explain to me what's going wrong here? He knows me well enough to know if he just tells me what to do, the lesson won't stick. But he knows if he smashes me for five minutes to the point where I say, okay, I need you to actually teach me this now, then it will stick forever. That kind of lesson is actually much more important to learn to read your opponent and their psychology and to, especially if you're the teacher, to, to educate them. I mean, it's funny. I remember one time I was visiting a gym and there was this, I, I guess he was a white belt, but he was really competitive and aggressive. And, you know, he, he was a big, strong guy. And it took me about a minute, I think, and I guillotined him the first time. And then he got really pissed off and frustrated and he started getting even more aggressive. But of course, because he was a white belt, he was making just bigger and bigger mistakes every time. And so then I caught, got him in 30 seconds and then he came flying at me the next time. And I tapped him in like five seconds and he was so pissed off. He stormed off the mats, basically like that <laughs> kind of thing. Learning to correct someone's mindset, that's way more valuable than just teaching them a guillotine defense, right? Because it became pretty clear to me very quickly that like, like, this is the kind of guy who gets flustered and angry and makes mistakes. And if you notice that pattern in your opponent, you can definitely exploit it. So I think a good instructor needs to make sure that they catch that in students and teach that to them, you know, how to be, have a more resilient mindset and not get flustered in a match. That I think is is just as important as any technical lesson you can teach. A hundred percent. And I, I think it really does translate back into daily life, you know, because there's nothing more real than being in a physical altercation, you know, regardless of we don't have strikes in jujitsu, but it's a high stress environment, you know, and we're all trying to psych each other out. We all have like our different psychological <laughs> strategies to overwhelm another person. Like maybe you try and spam someone with a lot of different tempo changes. It, it, it's easy to get frustrated. It's not, it's really not easy to usually stay calm, especially as a beginner. I think it takes a very special type of person to understand, okay, I, it's better that I stay calm here because it's not mm -hmm. easy to problem solve under pressure. I think that was one of the things also that really drew me to jiu-jitsu. I'm like very obsessed around problem solving. I'm very focused on trying to maintain my composure in high stress situations. And I think there's nothing more real than like, okay, I'm throwing myself at all these different problems, all these different people in the room. Like I know that I'm going to face a different set of problems in each role that I go through, whether it's normal class or pro training, whatever, or even once I enter the room, I'm already trying to observe the different types of people in the room. I'm trying to understand, like, oh, how are they going to communicate with me? I think it makes jujitsu so fascinating on that level, you know, like every role is really going to be extremely different. It's going to be extremely different conversation. It's almost like just Really, in a way, it is a social club. <laughs> We're kind of socializing with all of these different problems. So how, how do I get to the bottom of this? Yeah, it's sort of like a job interview when you're rolling with someone for the first time because, you know, you're there to present yourself as best you can. You don't really know what they want. You don't really know them and what they're looking for. So you're simultaneously trying to put forth a really good offense while also making sure you don't leave any gaping weaknesses. Like it's very much a feeling out process when you spar with anyone the first time. I definitely, I mean, even for the day one white belt, I, I'm very cautious of rolling with anyone for the first time because... It's like a job interview. You have no idea what that person's going to do. I remember one time I was rolling with a, like a day one white belt and I put him in a cross choke and he punched me in the face because <laughs> he, it's not that he meant to. It's just when, when that's, when you've never been in that reflex. situation before, yeah, your reflex takes over and he was so sorry about it, but like, you know, he, it wasn't even his fault. Actually, if anything, it taught me a lesson, which is that I can't control 
the behavior of my opponent all the time. Part of what I want to do with my jujitsu is I take a more dominant position is I want to take away their options so I can more predictably tell what they're going to try to do. But when you slap hands and bump fists and you start rolling, like I have no idea what a person is going to do. And I think that this is one of those interesting things. I mean, we all fall into the habit often of having favorite sparring partners. You know, we, we make friends in the gym and often if you're not thinking about it consciously, you wind up sparring with the same people over and over again. But that's not always a good thing because you can get so comfortable with their body language that you forget what it's like to not know who your opponent is and to not be intimidated by the unknown, right? I mean, that's one of the things I love about doing drop-ins at guest gyms is I'm going to get bombarded with people whose behaviors I'm not familiar with, right? I mean, maybe I'm used to guys who, you know, they're all guard pullers and then suddenly people are wrestling me and trying to cartwheel over my head. Like that's going to be very unexpected out of the gate. So I think that is one of the things we need to factor in when we're looking for our training partners is to understand that, you know, much like how you can stay in a relationship that you shouldn't be in just because it's comfortable, even if it's not the right one. The same thing can happen in jujitsu where you can gravitate towards training with the same people over and over again because you're used to them. I think sometimes there's more value to sparring with a strange white belt that you don't know versus sparring with like the same awesome brown belt or whatever a hundred times over, right? Because that inoculation to, to strangers, to new people and to what they might do, it, it keeps your guard up and prevents you from making idiot mistakes. I totally agree with that. Also, like I, I do agree with the joy in visiting a foreign gym or just dropping in somewhere new for the first time. I I fondly look upon a lot of my memories from being a blue belt. I would just drop into random gyms because I wanted to face different sets of problems. I was like, oh, if I go to this gym, I wonder if they play Dela Hivo. I wonder if they're <laughs> more like a wrestling type game here. And I, I think there's just so many different ways that we can also challenge our training partners, right? Like we don't, even when we have favorite training partners, something that I like to do with my training partners is always give feedback and not necessarily, I always try and do this in a constructive way, right? I know some people don't take feedback too well, but I, I always try and be as transparent as possible. If I'm giving my partner feedback, I have the expectation that they are going to do the same for me. And I make that very clear with them. I think we can say the same things, right? We can do the same techniques. We can sequence them in a certain way. But just like we do in in the English language, we have synonyms for things. We have variations of things. There's certain certain ways that we can do the same things with a different nuance or a different tempo a different direction i think there's so many different ways we can still do the same games but challenge our partners in such a way that we don't necessarily always have to focus just on the technique and i think that really challenges also the communication it's more like a way of reframing our game rather than let's say oh you play half guard you don't necessarily have to suddenly play oh you play spider lasso you can play the same game but you can totally reframe how you play it it's usually my belief i i often I often say to my training partners and uh, some of my students that when when you can identify that you don't have a, necessarily a technical deficiency, it's pretty hard to say that. I know overall, it's like, oh, you can always be better at technique. But overall, if you think your technique is at a certain level where your technique wasn't at fault, was it about the timing? Was it about the tempo? Just as you would say in a conversation, there's an art of timing when you're talking to someone and you can say something at the wrong time and it was like, oh shit, that was really, really badly timed that like you shouldn't have said that. It's like, oh, if someone's someone's family member just died and you were like saying something like even worse to make them feel really bad, it's like just terrible timing. I think the same in jujitsu too. Like sometimes things are poorly timed or we wait too long to say things. I think that really can challenge our training partners if we think away from just techniques. I know this is going in a slightly different direction, but of course there's so much that is defined as jujitsu, you know, like there's all these different physical attributes, there's a technique, then there's the timing, tempo changes. There's so much that we can think about in order to really gain and uh, reach that deep understanding of what I think is actually Jiu-jitsu, as you said, of course, in, in competition or in roles, we can try and dominate or impose by just 
speaking, speaking, speaking. We don't, if we don't let the other person speak, of course you're going to win the conversation, right? But I think it's much more interesting when you actually let them speak and then you dominate. And this is, this is <laughs> always what I've thought as well. Like in order to win on your own terms, right? Especially I'm a competitor. It, it's a really strange feeling and a way of thinking, you know, to still allow them to do something <laughs> and try and win because yeah. actually it's easier if you don't let them do anything, you know, but it's, I want to win on my own terms. If I'm not going to win on my own terms, that's just not me. Right. And that's not the way that I want to communicate. Yeah. A lot of really, really top level athletes that we talk to have actually said the same thing to me. I mean, there's nothing to be said wrong about the strategy of, you know, a win's a win, right? Some people are just sheer pragmatists. And at the end of the day, if your goal is to win, I mean, anything you do within the rules is fair game. And I, I do agree with a lot of people who say like, look, you know, I, I'm doing this because I want to win. And my whole strategy here is baked around me trying to win. But I've noticed a, a lot of other people say the same thing that you do. I'm, I remember Robert Deagle was on the podcast and he was saying that his goal in grappling is to grapple in the spirit of engagement. Like he believes that grappling is all about engagement and he wants to make sure that he stays true to that philosophy and that no matter what he does, he's always engaging. And if he manages to win, if he doesn't feel like he was effectively engaging his opponent, you know, maybe he was he was ducking it or being overly defensive and he's not really, you know, he's not really giving it his all. He doesn't feel like that's a true win. And I think there's something to be said about that, right? Especially as you start to clock in a lot of mat time, you start to think of jujitsu uh, less in terms of like the, the hills and the valleys you know, the, the good days and the bad days and the wins and the losses. And you think about it more as this long-term journey that kind of smooths out over time. And then the question becomes, am I happy with the direction I'm, I'm going in in this journey? And what are my, my principles? What is my philosophy? And that, that is kind of a, I, th I think a decision that a lot of people come to when they start to get around brown belt or black belt, they realize that there's more to jujitsu than just the mechanics on the mat, right? There's also the strategy that you employ and ultimately a sense of who you are and are your actions reflected in the reality of how you roll and that is such an interesting thing about this you know you were talking about this concept of a movement vocabulary maybe with a lot of more junior people they haven't really thought about this to that extent right they they're just doing moves and they just want to win on the mats but once you spar with someone who's been in at it for you know a decade plus and they've seen the good days and the bad days and now they're just on kind of a consistent journey you can really learn a lot from their life philosophy, I find, by the way that they actually train and the way that they roll. Oh, no, 100%. Like, I feel the way that I've informed myself over the years has really shaped how I live my life, too, because I feel in the beginning of my journey, I was looking and modeling my training and a lot of other things based on what the more senior people in the art were doing. Right. And again, it's more like we look to them for information like, oh, they've done it. They've reached that level. So they must know the way, right? That that should be the best way. But the more you partake in the art, the more you just live and experience and you start to learn your own ways as well. And I, I think a, a turning point for me actually was a pretty bad injury before Abu Dhabi World Pro when I was a blue belt. It was my second year as a blue belt and I had like a freak accident in the gym and I basically ended up uh, separating two parts of my my right foot. So I have a metal plate in my foot still. <laughs> oh boy. Yeah. And funnily enough, like my first concern was like, oh my God, going through the airport, like, am I going to make the detector go off? <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> like, nothing else was over. I was like, oh, shit, that's really fucking annoying. <laughs> I still went to Abu Dhabi. I was so stubborn. Like, I couldn't walk. I had internal bleeding in my foot. Because actually, when I went to the hospital, they didn't look at the x-ray properly. They told me, oh, no, it's fine. You just have a hairline fracture. But they only looked at one particular view of the x-ray. When they looked at the second view, because I, I went back two weeks later, and I, was, I told them I was experiencing a lot of pain. It didn't seem like it was getting any better. And also I, I saw a lot of discoloration on the sole of my foot. So I went back, they took another x-ray and they were like, oh my God, like it's like in this view, you can clearly see that like 
the first metatarsal of my foot was completely separated from the second. So by walking on it, I was creating discoloration because it was internally bleeding. I was like, oh my God. Oh boy. So from, from telling me it was going to heal by itself, suddenly it became, you have to have surgery right now. And I was like, lol, no, I'm going to Abu Dhabi. I won the travel package. So I, I still wanted to go regardless of whether I was going to win or lose. Just like I had to do it. Uh, and from then on, like I, I really challenged myself to find more sustainable ways to train, to live. And although like I, I'm not that old, I'm like 27 now. Like I, when I was like a blue belt, I was like my early 20s. The reason for flow is not necessarily because I'm looking to prevent injury per se, but again, like, I, I truly believe in finding balance any equilibrium like what does that mean to me it doesn't necessarily mean that i have to flow every day for example i think there's so many different versions of what balance is i don't think balance necessarily has to be a 50 50 thing i think balance can be achieved also by training extremely hard for a certain period of time and also taking it easier for another block of time you know i really believe in jiu-jitsu we have no concept of periodization uh, for, for competitors especially because where is the off-season? For every other professional athlete in any other sport, there is a concept of what off-season is. It's like we have to delegate for ourselves what an off-season is. And it's just not happening. <laughs> you know, so it, it's really interesting to also try and communicate with other competitors who are so used to this way of pohada. It feels like almost, I'm a very much like a black sheep in, in the competition scene. It's like a lot of people don't really necessarily agree with, oh, yeah, flow, what does that mean? Like flow doesn't necessarily mean soft. Like you know exactly what Bruce Lee used to talk about, where, like water can crash and water can like flow. It, it's up to you how the flow works. It can be a hard flow as well. I think there's so many different ways, but I think when people respond hard like that, you know, like, oh, what is that? That's also a type of communication. Like, why do you choose to communicate in that way? But I think there is a sense of openness. Like when you reach a certain level of deep understanding, you just continually share. You don't assert opinions per se, but this is just my, my personal take. Whenever I'm rolling with someone and I can tell that their, their breathing is really ragged or they're overly tense, I know I've won. Like, I know it's done at that point. It's just a matter of time, right? And at this point, one of the things I advocate for now is when you're teaching someone for on like day one, before you even sit down with them and start talking about, okay, here's what a guard is. Here's what a triangle choke is. I think the first thing to tell a new person is number one, always control your breathing. Number two, stay loose, you know, don't tense up because there's, that's such an indicator. If someone does, first of all, it's easy to exploit that, right? Like if you're, if you're very tense mechanically, it's easier for me to manipulate your body, but also it's such a, a telegraph about their body that tells me so much about the mindset, right? Like I can tell if someone is, if their breathing is really frantic and if they're constantly tense, I know that I have the psychological advantage right out of the gate. So it is one of those funny things where I think it's very important to be chill. I mean, you can still be intense, but to be in control of your own body, at least, and to not be, you know, such a little stress ball that people can just grab you and throw you because you're completely rigid. A hundred percent. I truly agree with what you said about the touch component. You know, like something I always say is like, we know that one of the first stages of any jujitsu fight or role is the hand fighting. And from that first touch, you immediately can sense your partner's intention, whether do they choose to touch you very softly or do they choose to grab you really hard? You know, like yeah. that already informs so much, especially for example, if I'm in a competition, if someone's grabbing me softly, I may choose to also respond in a very soft manner. If someone chooses to grab me really hard with a death grip that I'm like, oh boy, like I know what's coming now. You know, like it, it is, mm. as you said, a way of telegraphing. I think it's really, it's interesting that touch can convey so much. Like it really does communicate, okay, their intention is that they want to kind of hurt me. <laughs> yeah. Or it could be that they're afraid, right? I mean, if someone yes. thinks of you as an awesome stand-up fighter and they know they're bad at it, 
you can feel that. I mean, that that like quote unquote typical jujitsu posture where someone like they, they hunker back and they go totally tense and they're just like, I am not going to let you throw me no matter what. <laughs> right? I think so much of why we see so much guard pulling is because people take that posture. They're not looking to take you down. They're looking to not get taken down. And so I, if you grip with someone and you can feel that, that their objective is just no matter what, I'm not going to let you take me down. Well, if I feel someone do that, then I know I'm actually pretty safe because I know that their focus is on protecting themselves. They're not trying to take me down. They're trying to make sure I don't take them down. And so that there's actually a very powerful psychological tell if someone takes that really, really defensive posture where they're just, they're like leaning forward and they're straight arming you and they don't want to let you take them down. You can learn a lot about what someone's priorities are based just on the way that they grab you. A hundred percent. There's so much risk aversion in general when we're rolling, when we're competing. Like, I mean, I can even say this for myself, you know, like I'm not necessarily caught up with, oh, is someone going to take me down? Just purely because I know how fast I can pull guard. <laughs> you know, so <laughs> I am trying to increase my chances of being successful and executing my moves and also saying my piece in the conversation. To an extent, I do want to also speak first, but I want to also start the conversation from somewhere where I feel comfortable to have the conversation. Almost like this idea that I feel like it's a very common term in therapy, like set, setting my boundaries, you know, like I want to have the conversation here. Like I'm ready for the conversation now. I think it's, it, it's a really interesting way of framing it when we can just kind of look at jujitsu from this light. I think it definitely, like the more people that I've tried to expose to this way of looking at jujitsu, they, they've really started to also enjoy jujitsu from a different light because it becomes a lot more than just about the techniques in itself. Like I, I feel like at the level that I'm at, I don't necessarily learn new techniques anymore. It's more about refining and developing. I don't necessarily have the same sense of joy that I even had as a white or blue belt because I, I remember as a white and blue belt, I was so enthusiastic about any new technique. I should like, oh my God, I've never seen this before. Sure. What is that? You know, and nowadays it's like, I get the same joy more so when I teach a white, but it doesn't matter what belt. Like any, when I teach someone a new technique and I, I see how enthusiastic they are and trying to now also, this is also probably an interesting topic, but I think classroom formats, classroom formats, most mainstream classroom formats we always structure the class in the same way, right? It's like the warm up, the technique portion, then you might have a little bit of specific training and you have your rolling portion. There isn't much room for people to have discourse. There isn't much room for people to talk like this, right? And I understand, I've definitely been in a room where the teacher's really fond of talking and then you're like, oh shit, like they just talk for an hour. And like, as much as it's really nice, <laughs> like people, people are there to train. So I totally get that. But I think it's really important that there is some sort of component to integrate this into the art for further development. You know, that like I think it could really change the way that people achieve deep understanding. Like, I, I really wonder how many people will reach deep understanding of jiu-jitsu. Like, what, what does a belt even mean at, at a certain point anymore? You know, what, what does it actually say? Like, what does the belt communicate? So now we're going into how what belts communicate. But yeah, I think it's, it's truly interesting because also why does the belt matter? There's, there's so many questions, you know? Yeah, I had Bruce Hoyer on the podcast a while back and he was talking about implementing the reverse classroom model in jiu-jitsu where basically the idea is rather than the instructor coming in with a set curriculum where they tell everyone what to do students kind of do some homework beforehand and they pick what they want to work on and it's much more like a laboratory and the instructor is there to facilitate and maybe help answer questions if people are unable to solve things on their own. I've been off the mat since the pandemic started, but when I get back on, I'm really looking forward to giving that a try because I agree with you completely. I remember when I started out in this art, 
a, you know, a white belt and even a blue belt are just bundles of enthusiasm, right? Because everything that you show, it's probably going to be brand new to them. So it's like, it's like having a baby or a child. Everything is wondrous and new and exciting. And, you know, any technique you show them, there's a good chance it's going to blow their mind. But once you kind of have been through the ringer enough times and you've seen everything, I, I find I don't get much value out of reviewing new techniques anymore. I get more value out of being exposed to new philosophies or new strategies or new ways of manipulating the psychology of my opponent. I find that stuff to be much more at a black belt level to be the bigger breakthrough moments for me than just more volume of technical stuff. So yeah, I, I, I do agree with you there. Something I would want to maybe tie into that is I have noticed that, you know, as I get closer and closer to the, you know, being at the, the top of the seniority scale in the gym, a big part of getting what you want in the conversation that is jujitsu is manipulating the psychology of your opponent. I mean, it's one thing to come in and to have your own movement vocabulary, but it's another thing to start employing kind of second order tactics to try to throw your opponent off. I mean, I remember when I was a white belt, I was sparring with this brown belt and he kept telling me, Steve, you're telegraphing everything. And I remember thinking, oh, whatever, dude, that's not helpful advice to me because like you're a brown belt. Of course, you're going to kick my ass. But I, I realize now that white belts telegraph everything. That's why they're so easy to beat, because if you've been on the mats for any period of time, you know exactly what they're going to do. They can't help themselves, but to tell you with their body. And now what I find actually, like you said earlier, timing and finding those windows of opportunity is so important against a good opponent. So a good way to create those is to screw them up with body language and to try to be deceptive, right? To to try to use your body language to lie to your opponent, basically, in this conversation. I'm wondering if you ever do that. Do you do you ever tell lies when you're on the mat? Do you go out there and do you use deliberatively manipulative body language so your opponent thinks you're going one way, but you're actually not? You're going in the other? Oh, 100%. Like, I, I actually tell a lot of people that when I have to explain it out loud, that, like, whether it's just like as a concept or whatever, I, I think it's almost sociopathic, you know, because fighting, <laughs> to be a successful fighter, actually, it's all about the art of deception. If you're too clear with your communication, then everybody can see everything. It's not good to be a clear communicator because you know what's coming. What we're actually always trying to do is mask our intention, right? Whereas uh, often dancers are more looking to be clear. They want clarity in their movement. And actually, this is a really interesting point because I, I spent a few years cross-training in uh, contemporary dance and I realized they have a lot of opportunities to, they have basically a lot more room in the classroom to do research, personal research. So that means finding ways to be more clear in that movement because that is their objective, right? So just like going back momentarily to what you were saying about building an environment where you are more of a facilitator than a teacher, you know, you're not necessarily dictating what's happening more that you facilitate the room. Like what do the others want? You build the environment around people's needs rather than like, oh, this makes most sense because we have 30 people in the room and we have to do this in this and this structure, right? And I also think, of course, that you can divide the room into groups, so on and so forth, but not to go too much into that conversation. For sure, like when I'm fighting with people, often more so in the classroom, but I do this in competition too, I think of visual stimuli a lot. So what does that mean? So when someone's looking at me, if I only, for example, move my hands, then it's very easy to follow. You just follow my hand movement, right? But if I can give you several points of seven different points of references that you have to track, for example, my feet are moving, I'm doing a lot of footwork and I'm moving my hands, I'm moving my head. And also like there's very drastic tempo changes. The person doesn't really know, like, what am I trying to go for? Per se. And of course, like, I can't just mess around. I'm not just doing a bunch of movements. Like, I still have an intention that, okay, I'm going to go for this move, but I'm trying to distract them in that way that they perhaps have the focus at the wrong thing at the wrong time that allows me to have more opportunities to get what I want. So often, actually, this was almost a challenge set by a friend. He, he told me, hey, I want you to take some house dance classes and see how you can merge it with jujitsu. And he didn't give me any particular 
there was not necessarily any like, oh, you have to achieve this, right? It was very open-ended. But I, I did that. I did all of those things. So I started going to house classes. And house classes are pretty much based all around footwork. And of course, we know that guard passing is predominantly based around footwork. So I started playing with tempo and timing with footwork as a way to also to distract people and to deceive people. Because as we know, something that we use a lot in guard passing is the idea of misdirection. So I, with the combination of having two different tempos in the body, of course, it could be more than two as well. But just think about, okay, my feet have one tempo. Now my upper body has another tempo. This is very distracting for anybody to really look at, you know, like, oh, I, I don't know where to frame. Oh, suddenly the foot's here, now the foot's dead. I think it's really interesting to really build on this idea of like, oh, how, how many points of visual stimuli can I put out there? It, it really does, in my experience, increase success rate of advancing position. I'm really fond of it. Like people often think I'm fucking around in class. They're like, "Oh, why is she dancing around this person?" <laughs> da, 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 da. But it's like I, I have an intention. Whether it's like a cross step passing or a leg pin passing, the footwork is only temporary. You know, like I sometimes use house dance footwork in jujitsu, and then I mix it with different passing styles. Whether like you know the Rio to has popularized the leg pin passing, there's a lot of cross step passing from the Mendes brothers, for example. And I integrate all of those things all together because the actual reality for me is, jujitsu is, we can say jujitsu is jujitsu. We place the label on it, but at the end of the day, we all have the same human body, and this is all just movement. We're all just moving the human body, so actually things don't differ that much. The only thing that differs is actually. Oh, does it have a function? What are we trying to achieve? For example, with dance, we're not really trying to achieve anything. In dance, where you can argue that you want to express yourself, but I've spoken also to a lot of professional dancers, and dance is essentially purposeless. Whereas in, in jiu-jitsu, we are trying to get somewhere. We are trying to advance in position. Fighting has a function. So that, I think that's something really interesting to think about in terms of, yeah, like we're just trying to deceive each other all the time. If we're too clear with our intentions, that like we should be speaking in confusing ways. So like, oh, come again? What, what do you mean? I, I don't understand what you're trying to say. That's the way that we actually do advance in our movements or like more easily at least. Yeah, with jujitsu, it's like having a debate or it's like, you know, two lawyers competing in the courts where, they're effectively trying to to make their point and lure their opponent into a trap or create a weakness. And a big part of it is not showing your hand in advance if you can avoid it, right? Making sure that you try to catch the other person off guard with something they didn't expect. And you're talking about dance here. I love that. We A while ago, I was talking to Dominica, and one of the things that she said was, I look at jujitsu as a dance, but the people engaged in this dance don't know one another's choreography. So one dancer is always trying to pull the other dancer into their choreography, which I think is an awesome way to look at it, right? You're not just going through a routine, but you're intentionally trying to pull the other person into your routine. Yeah, no, a hundred percent. I think she put it in an excellent way. Like we really are trying to pull each other into each other's choreography for the most part. It's just always, again, the argument of whose choreography is better. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I mean, I, I know that one of the tricks that I noticed a while ago, I love to, for example, use the Ezekiel choke from Mount, but when you're sparring with anyone who has any modicum of defense and training, as soon as you start doing that, they're going to know that you're going for their neck and they're going to start defending. But something that I realized was you can use your body language to manipulate the person. So what I do now a lot of the time is if I'm going for a topside choke, I'll go for the choke They'll obviously bring up their hands to try to defend. I'll let them defend for a few seconds. Then I'll release the choke and they will drop their hands. And then when they drop their hands, I'll put the choke right back on again. <laughs> and I found that that's actually a surprisingly <laughs> effective way to use body language to manipulate your opponent is you, you know, they instinctively will try to defend their choke, but they will also instinctively stop defending when they think the threat is gone. So if you attack, stop, and then attack again, it often messes people up because that's not the rhythm that they're used to. 
That's really interesting. But yeah, I, I agree with this. Like, It's interesting how we can play with the idea of when do we attack? When do we defend? Like, I think that there's so many ways that we can entertain the game. And as you said, the more unorthodox we can be with sequencing our moves, like, like you're saying about oh, if you attack, it, it feels pretty obvious that we should defend there once the threat isn't present. We can go back to just doing our own thing. But yeah, I, I think that's something that could really be built upon, again, like in, in the classroom, if we can have more opportunities to discuss it. I think it would really be interesting how people's jujitsu would evolve at a much faster rate as well. Yeah, I think that that aspect of the vocabulary of movement and of teaching the the psychology of jujitsu outside of just the individual moves is such an underserved part of the art. And I think it's something that I'm, I'm really glad we explored here today. Do you have any other concepts or ideas that you wanted to put forth on this chat here before we tie this up? I just want to make sure that we got into everything that you wanted to get into, Margo. <laughs> I think there's always something that's going to come up. And then after this episode, I'm going to be like, oh shit, I should have said that. But definitely like other things that I have told you about in our previous uh, correspondence like I, I think it's really interesting to challenge the idea of like how do we train rhythm and i think that whole area of rhythm training is really interesting and it, it doesn't i don't really see it too present in jiu-jitsu you see it a lot more present in stand-up arts like boxing like you can see guys like lomachenko doing a lot of things that do look like rhythm training or i actually did a very experimental workshop series in China a few years ago that was basically a week-long workshop series that I kind of structured every day, almost like university lectures, where you'd have several sessions a day, but each each session had a slightly different theme or topic. For example, one would be more technique-based, one would be more like conceptual-based, and another one was based around rhythm training. And this is where I started to bring in metronomes and teach people how to move to a metronome. Very, very basic movements first. We're not looking at very sophisticated jujitsu sequences at that point, right? It's like, how, how do we go from the most simple form of understanding how to move our body with a metronome, understanding what, what establishing a dialogue of what tempo is. So I think a lot of people don't necessarily understand it. What, what is tempo in the context of jujitsu? We have an idea of what tempo is in terms of music, or if you think about a DJ, it seems pretty obvious. And then really, again, the idea of like, how can the body have more than one tempo? The idea of like polyrhythms or the idea of my upper body has one tempo, my lower body has one tempo. There's so many things that we can train. And even in thinking about what is the rhythm of attack, right? Like how many attacks are you going for in a certain period of time? Or it doesn't even have to be a tag. It could be any any sort of move, you know. And like, there's so many things that we could evaluate on. But I think rhythm training is something that would be really interesting to build upon in jujitsu, regardless of whether there's a metronome involved or not. But I thought it was a very interesting concept because eventually I introduced two metronomes into. By the end of the week, we had two metronomes and seeing how people basically took upon the task because I, I didn't really instruct anyone on how to move. I always like to see what kind of comes up organically for people, you know. I, I gave them basically six days of instruction and ideas from my experiences, from places that I've trained. And then on the seventh day, it's basically an open improvisation session. They can do as they like. I set them up with the task and they just went for it. It was very interesting just to see like, when I'm not dictating what happens when you're not being told what to do, when you just allow yourself just to be. It's very, very interesting. But yeah, definitely something that I think would be so, so fascinating to see developed within the art of jiu-jitsu. I would love to have you on to discuss that in detail because I agree with you that the idea of timing and momentum are shockingly unexplored in jiu-jitsu. I mean, they're really essential to almost any other combat art, right? They're so critical, for example, to judo. 
But it wasn't even until I got to Brown or Black Belt that I really started even thinking about the application of timing and about things like Kazushi and creating windows of opportunity. It's a surprisingly underdeveloped area of the sport. And I think the idea of creating a, a mixed tempo to throw off your opponent is fascinating. So yeah, please, if you ever want to come back on to discuss that, I would absolutely love that. Just let me know. 100%. Let's do it. Sounds good. Well, in the interim, I mean, I know that you're trotting the globe here, but if people want to learn more about you or see what you're up to, what's the best way for them to do that? Currently, the best way is to reach me through Instagram. My Instagram handle is at the Nomadic Mars. I also have my own personal website, which is the nomadicid.com. It can also be reached by an alternative domain, margocheccarelli.com. Awesome. Fantastic. Well, I do appreciate you coming by, Margo. Thank you so much. And I'd love to have you on in the future. And of course, to everyone out there who's listening to us, I think you all know, but the people who keep the lights on here at BJJ Mental Models are our paid subscribers on BJJ Mental Models Premium. That's powered by Patreon. If you want to go there and get on board, patreon.com slash BJJ Mental Models is the way to do that. That's where we house all of our premium content, strategy courseware, and of course, access to our Discord community and other great perks. So at the bare minimum, please do check it out. Greatly appreciate it and definitely worth the value. Patreon.com slash BJJ Mental Models. Margo, thank you so much for coming by. Really enjoyed this chat. Fascinating topic. And I'm definitely looking forward to finishing the conversation later when we talk about rhythm training, because I think that's going to be a great one too. And thank you so much for inviting me onto this episode. Like, it's been a pleasure to put out all these thoughts of someone. So like someone like yourself. <laughs> <laughs> a fellow nerd when it comes to jujitsu. I mean, I think our sport has a lot of those, but always exactly. <laughs> glad to collaborate and glad to share this stuff because I think this is a very unique conversation and I don't believe, I'm not really aware of anyone who's ever had this conversation in the context of jujitsu, at least not on a big stage. So hopefully this is helpful to all of the listeners as well. So as always, thank you, Marco, for coming by. And of course, to everyone out there who does spend the time to listen to us. Thanks again. And I guess we'll talk to you guys next week. 